Good morning, everyone. I'm Jonathan Little. Today, we are going to be discussing three tips to improve your poker win rate. Now, there are many, many, many things you can do to improve your win rate, but I want to discuss three very broad topics that some people get right and some people get wrong. Now, if you have any tips to improve your win rate, feel free to type them in the chat. Everyone can see, myself included. I'll discuss any of them that come up. Is there any merit to folding Jack-8 offsuit in a cash game? Why, yes, there is. It's not a very good hand. Uh, you should probably fold the bad hands. So let's get right to that. Study the fundamentals. You must understand how to play competently. Jack-8 offsuit is not a premium hand. Okay, next, you have to learn to be honest with yourself. Most of you are liars, at least to yourself. Next, you have to have good discipline. We're going to discuss all three of these things in depth. First things first, study the fundamentals. If you do not know how to play poker well, you're going to have a difficult time winning. You can't spell fundamentals without fun. To be fair, playing good, strong GTO poker is actually a whole lot of fun. A lot of people think it's boring and rigid, but they just haven't studied it. They don't realize all the insane bluffs you should make. Did you all see the insane call Justin Sleeva made the other day? in the $25,000 buy-in Triton tournament. I don't remember the exact spot, but basically his opponent led into him for a huge amount on the turn, and he called it off with something like bottom pair, and he was good. And actually, middle pair, he called off middle pair, next to bottom pair, fourth, third pair, third pair with four cards on board. And that's a spot where if you study GTO a lot, you know it's an easy call. If you have studied GTO a lot and you know your opponent over bluffs a little bit, because a lot of people don't lead two pair in that spot, you know it's a really easy call, and he called it off. You want a big pot. And a lot of people think that fundamentals mean playing boring, tight ABC poker. A long time ago, one of my friends, Dave Benefield, who was helping me out, learn to beat uh, 1020 No Limit, 2550 No Limit online back a long time ago, I was struggling. And he said, just play ABC poker. And then I was playing, and I still wasn't doing great. And he said, well, it's pretty clear my ABC is different than your ABC, which was true. He knew how to play a whole lot better than I did, especially in those particular games. I was going from sit and goes. He had played sit and goes a ton, and or he had played cash games a ton, and I had not. And I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I was supposed to play weak type poker, and I was wrong. I was bad. And if you're bad, you're gonna have a tough time winning. Who'd have thought? Okay. If you want to make sure you understand the basics, the absolute minimum. You must understand, to even play poker and beat your bad poker playing friends, check out pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. It's a free three-hour crash course. It'll get you up to speed. Next, from there, once you know that, I would highly recommend you go through the pokercoaching.com tournament or cash game masterclass, depending on whatever game you're going to be playing. These are long courses. They're about 40 hours long, but hate to break it to you. You have to study a little bit to get decent at poker. This is going to get you up to speed quickly so that you can further study from anyone in the poker space because a lot of poker coaches out there just use terminologies or strategies or discuss things that you're going to be oblivious to if you have not gone through these courses. And also, you're going to be way better than most of your opponents. Also, you want to make sure that you record your hands and then study them away from the table. If you've gone through the content at Poker Coaching, you'll know how to do this, but assuming you don't, well, even if you do, definitely hire a coach or get in a peer group. We actually have the Poker Coaching study sessions happening right after this show today in the Poker Coaching Discord, ran by Louis Philippe here in the chat. Shout out to Drooly, who shipped a World Series of Poker ring last night. Dooley, not Drooly, Dooley, who shipped a World Series ring last night. A huge congratulations. I have a whopping zero rings, so uh, you're crushing me on that metric. Good job, good work. Speaking of the fundamentals, is it possible to find the bluffing flow chart as a downloadable file somewhere? Yes. Email support at pokercoaching.com and we'll see if we have it. Actually, I know we have it because um, I've shared it with all of you somewhere today. Is this live? No, it's on about a one second delay. Sorry about that. I can't make the internet go any faster. This down here at the bottom is very important. Pretty much everyone who has gotten good at poker has a study group or a coach or multiple coaches. I, for, well, even today, anytime I'm going to go learn anything new, 
whether it be poker or anything else, I hire a coach because I realize that by paying the coach some amount of money and getting, let's say, 10 hours of their time, I am getting all of the information that they have learned consolidated to help me be the best I possibly can. Now, to make the best use of coaches, usually you have to come very prepared. If somebody wants to come to me for private coaching, I pretty much demand they go through the tournament or cash game masterclass first because I don't want to waste either of our time, right? And most coaches out there will want you to be at least somewhat competent because there's a lot of free, very structured material out there that will make you somewhat competent. Some people come to me and they're like, okay, I have a, a, a cousin and they don't know anything about poker and I want them to learn poker. Can you teach them? And my answer is every single time, go to the videos. Some people don't like that. They want one-on-one -on -one interaction. It's not what I do. I'm trying to get you to be as good as you possibly can, as quickly as I possibly can. And I have laid out literally the blueprint to get good at poker. I've already done it. I don't need to remake it. This way you can go through it in your spare time and it takes me zero t amount of time and it costs you almost no money. It's win, 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 win. I try to set up win-win situations for everyone over and over and over. But you really do need to get a coach. And if you're not going to get a coach, you need to get a peer group. I made a point to have lots of friend groups in the poker space. I still do. And anytime I want to talk to them about any poker hands, any poker situations, whatever, they're all happy to help me. And usually I get pretty great information. And, you know, if you talk to enough people, maybe you find some people who disagree with other people, whatever, you can consolidate the information, triangulate it. Next thing you know, you end up with a pretty good answer. And if you get a pretty good answer, most of the time, you're going to be very, very happy. Fundamentals, courses, not loading. No, don't tell me that. Don't tell me that. Pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. It was literally working yesterday. I'm going to look it up on my phone. Let's see. Let's see. Can I do it on my phone? Poker coaching. Gosh, I can't type. I have an ice pack on my foot and it's freezing my foot off because my son James crushed me at soccer yesterday. My wife made a pass and it was not a great pass and I went for it anyway. Next thing you know, I'm stepping on the ball, falling and twisting my ankle. So I have an ice pack on my ankle right now. Can you see it? Look. Ugh. We're living the dream over here. I do have pants on. That's good. No, pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals works, everyone. Come on. Is this a paramide scheme? Is this a paramide scheme? No, this is a poker training free YouTube channel. Enjoy. Study the fundamentals. Get good. If you're not good, you're going to lose. If you're not good, you're going to lose. Simple as that. We discuss this a ton. To win at poker, you have to find a game you can beat, play it a lot, and keep a proper bankroll. Okay? That's it. Step number one, find a game you can beat. If you're bad at poker, because you've not studied a ton, you're probably going to lose. Simple enough? Does that make sense? You cannot keep a bankroll. Well, if you, okay, let's think about this. Let's think, let's think of this. You know what? Before we get to this, be honest with yourself. If you find a game you can beat, why can't you keep a bankroll? Are you not playing very much? Maybe you're not playing very much. If you're not putting in volume, you're not going to win. You got to play hands. Y'all may not know this, but you win or lose some amount of money every single hand you play. Every hand you are dealt in, you win or lose some amount of money on average. So you win or lose some amount of money on average. So if you play a million hands and you make one penny per hand, which is almost nothing, even in the tiny stakes, you can make more than one penny per game. You're going to make a ton of money. So it either means you haven't found a game you can beat because you're bad or because you cannot assess your skill accurately. You're not playing enough or you're just playing way above your bankroll. And I hate to break it to you. If you don't do all three, you're probably going to be a lifelong loser at poker. Tough. Nobody wants to tell you that, but it is true. Look at this. I say it right here. Be honest with yourself. Did I just type that while I was sitting right here? I'm so confused. It's literally what I was just saying. Most people think they are pretty good at poker. They think they've studied the fundamentals. They've played poker for a year. They must be good. Okay. However, most people are not pretty good at poker. Most people are bad because they don't find a game they can beat. They don't play it a lot and they don't keep a proper bankroll. So you must keep track of your results. You must keep track of your results. If you do not keep track of your results, you'll have no clue if you're winning or losing. So many people every year 
thousands of them, literally thousands of poker players, smash their local games. They crush the small stakes games in their local region because most of those players in those local regions are not very good because if they were good, they would move up in stakes. They would get so good to the point that they can't play for big enough money in their local area and they would move to somewhere where they can play much higher stakes games. It's just how it works. There are not very many good poker players in most local jurisdictions. There are some, there are some, but if you get really good, typically you move to where you can play even bigger stakes. Fine. All these players crush their local games. And then they take the ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars they win to the World Series of Poker because they want to win a bracelet, because they're playing to try to win trinkets as opposed to money. And they take their thirty thousand dollars and they usually lose. And then they go back home. They're sad. They're depressed. They wonder how could I possibly lost? I beat all of my local friends who are no good at poker. And that's exactly it. They go and play tougher games and they lose. And what they don't even realize is that they're only playing against all of the hometown heroes. They're not even playing against the best players. They're playing against the players who are okay. They're good enough to beat their peer group. They're not good enough to beat actual professionals. And then some of them actually do win. They get a hold of a few hundred thousand dollars. They think, oh my gosh, I'm so good at poker. Look how good I am. And now they decide to go play bigger games. They start playing the random $3,500 buy-in tournaments or $10,000 buy-in tournaments or even bigger. Fine, you know, we'll see how it goes. And uh, 99 out of 100 times, it does not go well. Every once in a while, every once in a while, somebody gets through this entire long filter and they actually become a good high stakes pro. But most of the time, when people try to get rich quick, it goes horribly wrong. Hate to break it to you, that is just how it goes. So, if you wanna try to parlay and turn a little bit of money into a lot and fail, 999 out of a thousand times, or do you want to succeed long term and set yourself up for long term success? Because imagine you just played in your local games and you won your $20,000 a year. Do that for 10 years. Maybe you move up a little bit along the way. You get a hold of $200,000 or $300,000. Now you're pretty well bankrolled to play $1,000 tournaments or $1,500 buy in tournaments, which is fantastic. It's exactly what we are going for. Have you seen the UK, UK player who won the 100? thousand pound free roll at Triton and binked the 20k for 380. Yeah. Good job. Good work. I'm glad to hear it. I think a lot of people though think that that is the norm. A lot of people think that running hot, winning a satellite, getting into a big tournament, winning the big tournament is normal because somebody's going to do it. Maybe unless a pro gets a hold of the money and wins, but you have to be honest with yourself. You must keep track of your results. I mean, satellite players are uh, the ones who really struggle with this because they don't really keep good track of all of their losses in the satellite. And they especially don't keep good track of their actual wins or losses in the big tournament. They think, oh, I satellite it in. I got in for free. It's not how it works. You didn't get in for free. You got in for eight bullets on average. And even if you're good at the satellites and you get a seat to the main tournament one out of eight times, where you're supposed to get it one out of 10 if you're neutral, you're probably really bad at tournaments because you're used to playing this weird satellite structure. And then you're probably going to be really good at cashing the tournament. 35% of the time, maybe. But you just don't win the tournament because you're not accustomed to playing to try to get a hold of all the chips. And that results in you not winning. Who'd have thought? Anyway, please, please, please keep track of your results. Play within your bankroll. See pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. And stick with the guidelines. I have it all laid out for you. We have, the, we have all of the strategy laid out you need to succeed. We have the bankroll requirements set out that you need to succeed. All you have to do now is sit down, put your butt in the chair and play some poker. You have to be disciplined. You have to be willing to do that. We're going to talk about discipline in just a second. Why can't we all be winners? You know, funny enough, everybody here in this chat actually could be a winner if they did those three things I recommended. Every single one of you could be a winner. Isn't that crazy? Poker is really not that hard. The problem is that you may have to accept not winning as much as you would like to potentially win. A lot of people want to win a lot. And the problem with poker is that a lot of people see people who are close to comparably skilled as them playing games that are higher and they are winning. And you think, oh, this guy's, I'm better than this guy. Why don't I move up? Well, why don't you move up? First things first, maybe you don't have a proper bankroll. Second, maybe you aren't as good as you think you are. Maybe you're not at so good as assessing the other person's skill. So I was saying Brad, I just described Brad Owen, somebody playing too high for their own good. 
I don't know that. I'm not Brad Owen. I don't know his skills. I don't know his results. I don't know what he's doing. And to be fair, maybe he's not playing to make money. Maybe he's playing to make content. Do you ever think about that? Some YouTube content creators make good money. You ever consider that one? Um, not me. We make no money. At least on YouTube. That's okay. I don't mind. I do all this for free for all of you. Anyway, anyway, anyway. What were we talking about? Oh, yeah. You don't know what's going on with other people. Realize. I say it right here. Goodness. It's like I... It's like I've made this in the middle of the stream. Realize that your thoughts are not necessarily relevant. Also, don't try to like pick on other people or hate on other people or any of this. It's a waste of your time. I'm in the process of talking with a big poker news company right now and something I'm going to try to get them to skew away from is essentially opinion pieces that trash people that you don't even know. You have to realize you all don't know exactly, precisely, how good Brad Owen is, unless he's publishing his results somewhere very clearly. And most people, if they do publish results, publish a minimal amount of results without good, relevant statistics. Like how many hours did I put in? Where was I playing? What times did I do the best? Et cetera, et cetera. Who were the people I was tracking around? I'm assuming they're playing cash games. You obviously are tracking the fish, right? So you need to realize that you don't have a clue. You don't have a clue about other people and... And why are you focusing on other people instead of focusing on yourself? It's very important to focus on yourself because at the end of the day, I don't really care how much other people are winning or losing. What I care about is how much am I winning or losing? Because it doesn't really matter to me if those other people are winning more money or less money than me. A lot of people, they have some ego thing where they think, oh, I have to be the best poker player. I have to prove that I'm the winner. Like, why? What's wrong with you? Do you have some like trauma that is bothering you in the past that's making you think that you have to be macho or a bully or whatever. It's tough. I can guarantee you Brad is not publishing clearly the bad players he's chasing around. I can guarantee you he doesn't do that. Nobody does that. I don't even know if Brad thinks about that. Some people do, some people don't. I don't know. I haven't talked to him about it. I think a lot of people uh, don't really understand the things they should be tracking. Maybe that's relevant. Um, you want to keep track of the venues you do best at, which to some extent informs which structures are best. It also informs the general player pool at the specific venue. It perhaps informs the rake, uh, the rake situation at the table, etc. You want to keep track of the players who you are especially crushing because uh, obviously if you know they arrive at the casino at 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights, well, you better have your butt in the chair at 6.58, ready to go, right? Obviously, um, you want to make sure you actually get to sit and play the seat. You want to make sure you actually get a seat at the table. Back when I played at Bellagio, I would show up for the 10.20 game. It would start at about 1 p.m. every day. And if you were not in the seat at 12.45, you did not get to put in volume because the game would fill, right? And so you inevitably had to play with some good players, and then you have to make sure you are actively chasing the bad players within reason. You know, within reason, within reason. So anyway, you got you to gotta keep track of things beyond just how much money did I win? Because how much money did I win is not actually a good metric of success because it's not hard to win money. You just put in a lot of volume. Imagine you put in 120 hours a week and you make $15 per hour. It's actually a pretty good, win pretty good amount of money at the end of the year. Let's get out the calculator. Let's get out the handy dandy calculator. If you're willing to grind like a robot, Let's see, 120 hours per week times 52 weeks a year times $15 an hour equals $93,000 if you are a small to medium winner at 1-3 No Limit Hold'em. You'll make almost $100,000 a year if you just put your butt in the chair and grind. All you got to do is put your butt in the chair and grind. Anyway. Again, why is everybody going off about Brad Owen? You all are nuts. What is what is wrong with you worrying about other people so much? Stop worrying about other people. This is exactly what I'm trying to tell the news company to stop doing. It's like, who cares what random people do? I probably know Brad Owen better than almost everybody here. And I don't even care what he's doing. You know, like, have fun. Enjoy yourself. Good, good. Like, you're winning or losing a ton. It doesn't make a difference. And when I say Brad Owen, I mean, insert any other person, you know? Like, unless you have a piece of their action, why do you really care that much? And I get that a lot of you out there are fans. Do I say it or do I not say it? Yeah, I'll say it. Why not? We're trying to be honest here. You got to be honest with yourself. Watching other people do things 
just to observe, just to be entertained, is probably not going to improve your life all that much. Certainly there is time for entertainment. And to be fair, poker is entertainment for most people. But, but, you're kind of wasting your time. To be fair, every day, when it's lunchtime, I play a game of Hearthstone. A children's card game. Kind of like poker. Children's card game. I play a children's card game for 30 minutes that I cannot make any money at. Purely because I like it. I let myself waste 30 minutes a day. It's about the only 30 minutes of the day I waste, but I give myself that. A lot of people, though, waste a lot of time. And they think that they're doing something besides wasting their time. They think they're like learning or studying or something. And maybe they are, maybe they aren't, right? But you are what you eat at the end of the day. And you are what you consume. And I want to make sure all of you make a point to consume things that either make you a whole lot happier or a whole lot healthier or a whole, or a whole lot smarter or a whole lot richer. One of those four things. Definitely focus on that. That's going to go a long way to ensuring that you succeed in life. If you're doing things that just make you entertained, yeah, I mean, maybe it makes you happier. But I think a lot of people just want to sit there and be entertained all day. And that inevitably makes them not healthier, not richer not smarter, and a bit of a waste. What deck do I play in Hearthstone? I play uh, Battlegrounds. I love Battlegrounds. Haven't played regular Hearthstone in years. It's not a waste if it gives you energy. Well, that's the, that's the thing, right? Like, what, what should give you energy? Should um, being entertained give you energy? I don't know, maybe. Maybe. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's giving you some things that I've learned throughout my life. Take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. It's tough because a lot of people don't want to be honest with themselves and they don't want to realize that they are squandering a lot of time. I'll give you a good example. I love playing Magic the Gathering. I think it's probably the best game. Specific formats. But I am never going to be a professional Magic the Gathering player. I am never going to make a ton of money for Magic the Gathering. I maybe make 20000 a year or so from buying and selling high-end stuff. But I'm never going to get rich from this, right? So should I do it? Well, I decided about five or six years ago to not do stuff that is going to not make me those four things we discuss, and magic doesn't fit in. So you know what I did? I killed it. I probably watch um, one hour of Magic the Gathering content on YouTube every, every two weeks, give or take, just to get my fix. I gotta get my fix. You know, I'm jonesing over here. But I haven't played in years. And that's kind of unfortunate. It's something I love. It's something I like to do. It gives me energy. It's a lot of fun but it doesn't fit in my life because it does not achieve my goals. And I want all of you to have good, realistic goals that you can actually achieve that push yourself to be the best that you can be. Okay? That's it. That's it. Cash for 1300 bucks in a tournament. Good job. Good work. No one likes it whenever I say things such as... Um, Don't, don't do some of the things you're doing. And so, certainly I'm not telling you to not do or do not do anything. I'm saying try to make the most of your life. You only have one opportunity. Maybe we get reborn. Who knows? Maybe we're in a simulation. Maybe they put us back in. Maybe we become batteries. Who in the world knows? And that's that. Is 17 hours a day a reasonable expectation? You just calculated it at the small stakes. No, that was a joke. Did you like the joke? I will say, though, I'm giving my results. Back in the day, when I played at Bellagio, I would play 5, 10, or 10, 20, no limit hold'em, 70 hours a week. 10 hours a day is easy to do. If you can't sit at a table for 10 hours a day, you need to work on your discipline. So, 10 hours a day. So that's 70 hours a week. I took no off days. I, think, I, I don't do off days. Uh, 70 hours a week times, let's, let's, say, let's say I do get busy. So let's say I do, only do 50 weeks a year. Times, $110 an hour. $385,000 a year. This is what is reasonably achievable at 5 to no limit hold'em in a place that is populated with a lot of decently weak players, also with a lot of games you can actually put in volume. When did I start playing Hearthstone? I started playing Hearthstone when it came out. As it, because Magic the Gathering Online was no good, and Magic the Gathering Online is still no good. But yeah, 30, 30 minutes a week. <laughs> 
Hearthstone's another example. I used to get Legend every month, and it was just like a huge waste of my time. It's good, another good example. If it, With Hearthstone, you can become a legendary player, one of the best players every month. And all I have to do is just put in volume and not be terrible. And you will get it. And they give you a nice little badge and some digital packs of cards for your 40 hours or 80 hours or 100 hours or whatever of grinding. Makes you feel good, but doesn't really matter. There's a saying, some of you aren't going to like it. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. I don't want to win stupid prizes. I want good prizes. And to be fair, like, maybe <laughs> extrapolate to poker. You're good at poker. All you win is money, maybe a trophy. Does it really matter at the end of the day? I don't know. 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 That said, a lot of the games are really good training grounds. My son James is playing chess tournaments now, and a lot of parents there are like, yeah, my kid's going to become the best chess player in the world. I'm sitting there thinking, no, they're not. <laughs> hate to break it to you. There's not very many best in the world. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I've always been a proponent to play a game with the future. And again, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish out of your game. But at the end of the day, you got to make money somehow. And I would love, I would love, love, love to play a game that also, I, that I enjoy that also pays the bills. Wouldn't it be great to be able to pay your bills and have fun? I was talking to someone about this the other day, that all I do is have fun. The only things that I do is my hobbies. Poker used to be my hobby. Got good at it. Played a lot of poker. I do a bunch of other stuff now. Inve investing in other companies. I love helping other people run businesses. Now I invest in businesses and help them make money. This is like, it's fun. It's all fun for me at the end of the day. I would recommend you find the things that are fun for you and then figure out how to make some sort of money from them. Luckily, you all have YouTube. Now I can be a YouTube content creator. A course for beginners. PokerCoaching.com slash fundamentals is completely free. All right, all right. This is one that you also are not going to like. Realize that your thoughts are not necessarily relevant. Uh, I'll tell you all something that happens with me. If I ever go out and have too many drinks, I realize in my head my thoughts become absurd and that they do not matter at all. I think a lot of people, though, walk around kind of drunk. <laughs> not from alcohol, just like naturally. And they think ridiculous things. For example, you all like talking about Brad Owen. You walk by Brad Owen at the casino and he's playing 25, 50, no limit. Some of you here are going to walk by Brad Owen playing 25, 50 and no limit and think, he doesn't deserve to play 25, no limit. Hold him. He should be playing 5, 10. I'm better than him. Why am I not playing 25, 50? That whole thought process is stupid. But... Some portion of people who walk by random nice Brad Owen sitting there just playing a card game, they're going to think that absurd thought. And if you think these things, you have to realize very quickly, you have to correct yourself. Hey, hey, whoever's talking inside my head, that was a really dumb thought. Let's not be dumb, okay? Or, or let's say you're a 2-5 no limit hold'em player. You have a nice bankroll, let's say 25,000 bucks. We go on a big downswing, you get down to $12,000. You may think, well, I don't want to move down to 1-2 or 1-3 because then all the people at 2-5 will see me and they'll think that I'm bad at poker and they'll laugh at me. Therefore, I'm just going to keep playing 2-5 and risk my longevity in the game. Well, that's a stupid thought, right? You should not really worry what random people playing a card game think about you. Especially when you're doing the wise and prudent thing. So... Are you honest with yourself? Are you willing to move down? Are you willing to do the right thing to succeed? I mean, I don't know. I hope so. Most people aren't, though. They have gigantic ego problems. They want to always compare themselves to each other. They want to fight with each other. They want to cause drama. They want to feel like they are engaging in something. And that's tough. That's tough because it's just irrelevant. What, what should you three bet with if they call any amount preflop? Hands that are ahead of their range. Next, take a step back and assess all situations. Just take a step back. Take a, get out of your mind and look at yourself from outside of your mind. Do this little learning experiment where 
put yourself right over there, looking at you, looking at your computer, looking at your phone or whatever you're watching right now. Can you see yourself? Some people can do this easily. Some people, it's a struggle. And you need to be able to look at situations from an outside point of view. Not, it's not all about you at the end of the day, right? You need to be able to step back and realize that you are just one random person on this world doing your best to succeed. And um, it's not all about you. I think a lot of people think it's all about you. Even though you are the main character in your movie, your non-playable character in everybody else's movie, Maybe an exciting one, maybe a boring one, depending on who you ask. And you got to realize, you, you just have to realize, you have to realize that at the end of the day, it's not all about you. I think a lot of people do think it's all about them. And I think that is a problem. I mean, especially in the poker space where at the end of the day, you are trying to win money for yourself. It's easy to get wrapped up in the idea that everything I want is not necessarily what is best for me or the people around me, right? I'll give you a good example. Re-entry tournaments. Some people love re-entry tournaments. Some people hate them. They're really, really bad for the bad players. They're really, really good for the casino. They're really, really good for the pros, the best pros. They're really, really bad for the mediocre pros. They're really only good for the best pros and the casino. Now, a lot of players, because they haven't done math and they don't understand how math works and how variance works, they think re-entry tournaments are great for everyone. And they result in a lot of players going broke. And they result, a lot in the, result in a lot of the money going to the casino and going to the best poker players in the world. And that's a problem. The best poker players in the world, they're all about it. Yeah, re-entry tournaments, re-entry tournaments. Without realizing... They have wrecked many, many, many local poker areas. And, you know, are they going to wreck things long term? I don't know. I don't know. I do not know. How do I keep track of my results? Excel. Although there are various apps you can use. Anyway, step back and assess all situations. Realize that uh, you, you don't want to kill the game in exchange for making a lot of money quickly. I'll give you another example. With a lot of these private games that are popping up now, if you are a player like me, who is known to be a decent poker player, you can't go there and play decent poker. You better be throwing a party and having fun within reason. You can certainly still try to win, but you also can't sit there and play super duper nitty poker. And that'll get you in trouble. And they'll kick you out. And you won't get to play anymore. So you have to realize whatever edge I have, I'm going to sacrifice some of it in exchange for being able to play here long term, which is fine and good. Anyway, you got to be honest with yourself going on tangents over here that don't apply to most people. This is the real one right here. Do this. Realize you probably think you're pretty good at poker. You may or may not be pretty good at poker. Most people are not. And you need to keep track of your results. At the end of the day, if your bankroll is not growing consistently, if you are not moving up in stakes, if you're not winning a ton of money, well, you're probably not that good at poker. And being good at poker is more than just actually knowing how to play your cards well. If you're, if you're not making money, you're probably not that good at poker. Can I explain why re-entries are bad for everyone except for the casinos and the elite players? Yeah, sure. Fine. Um, casinos is good, obviously, because more people pay rake. They used to have re-entry tournaments that they did not take rake on. They got rid of those. Now they have re-entries where they take rake. So it's basically like a re-entry, or it's like a rebuy. I said the wrong thing. It's like a rebuy except for now they take a rake. Clearly very bad for players because they're raking the players to death. It's good for the best players because every time the best player buys in, pretty much no matter the situation, they're going to extract some edge. Even if they buy in late, they're going to extract like 10 or 15% return on investment. Great. Good for them. The best players are going to be extracting edge every time they buy in, and they're willing to buy in an unlimited amount of times because they know every time I buy in, I make some amount of money. Fine. The bad players. Every time a bad player buys in, they lose some amount of money. They get to buy in more, so they're going to lose their money faster. That's bad for them because eventually that means they're going to go broke way faster. Um, this is the reason online poker is very, very tough because the bad players go broke very quickly because they can just fire in more and more entries. If you can only buy in for one tournament a day or two tournaments a day, you just can't lose that much money. But if you can buy in five times in two different tournaments, you can lose 10 buy-ins a day. You lose 10 buy-ins a day too many times in a row, you're going to realize you're bad at poker and you're going to quit. Okay? 
Or the marginal pros, this is where it's a little bit tough because marginal pros usually have a small edge, right? Let's say you have 20% return on investment at the start of the tournament. Fine, good, fine, good. You buy in early, you get your 20%, win or lose. Now, as you play, if you rebuy in later, that 20% return on investment is inevitably gonna be lower. How much lower is the question? Well, if it gets below like 10%, you're just losing the rake, right? So now you have to make sure that you are rebuying in with an edge. The issue though is that now the edge gets diminished. Maybe you're buying in now for something like 2%. Maybe you win 2% after the rake. You know how many buy-ins you need in a thousand person tournament with a 2% return on investment? The answer is infinite. You need a lot. I don't even know what the number is, like a thousand or 2000 or something. I don't even know. <laughs> so now you're playing this game where you have a min minuscule edge and you're definitely not bankrolled for it. If you're not bankrolled for the game, you're inevitably gonna go broke. It's just how it works. So it's very, very bad for the mediocre pros because the edge they have gets diminished quickly because it's all going to the best players who continuously rebuy with some sort of an edge. You have $100 to $100,000 in six months course. I literally just told you all how to do it. Did you, not, did you not listen? Find a game you can beat, play it a lot, keep a proper bankroll, easy. Probably have to put in a lot of volume. Next, have discipline. Play excellent poker all the time. You must play well. If you do not play well, you're going to lose. Step number one, find a game you can beat. If you're tilting, because you are a child with ego problems, then that's not gonna work out for you. Tilt is for fish, do not be a fish. Do you need to go on about tilt? Be honest, who goes on tilt here most of the time when you play? Be honest, type it in the chat. You calculate your edge by your average played EV of all of your hands. You can look at your win rate per big blind and big blind per hundred, um, either adjusting for all in EV or not. But essentially at the end of the day, you need to, you need to figure out how, how many big blinds per hundred you're winning or how, what your return on investment is in a tournament. <sighs> Every entry pays rake. If, if a player enters three times, the casino gets paid thrice. Yes. Casino gets paid thrice. That means they get 0.3 buy-ins out of you instead of 0.1. That's a lot. That's triple. Literally triple. Considering tilt, and considering what I said earlier, say something bad happens to you at the poker table. And the funny thing is, is something bad means something different for everyone. Some people get mad when they have pocket aces and they lose. Why? Because uh, they don't understand math, I guess. Some people get mad whenever they play a hand poorly. Most good players fall in that category. And why? You think you're going to play perfectly all the time? You think you're infallible? You think you're some poker god who's never going to mess up? No, you're going to mess up sometimes. Some people get mad when um, the cocktail waiter spills a bottle of wine in your lap. Some people get mad when the dealer messes up. Some people get mad because their opponent says something they don't like. People get mad for all sorts of ridiculous reasons. Understand that at the end of the day, basically everything is out of your control. Basically everything is out of your control, okay? Most people think that everything's in your control, but it's not. Even at the poker table, you don't control your opponents, you don't control the cards, you don't control the dealer, you don't control the, control the waitress, you don't control the venue. You do control how you play, but do you really? Do you really? Do you really? You think whenever a basketball player goes to shoot a free throw, the easiest thing they can possibly do is they practice a million times. You think they're trying to miss when they miss 18% of the time or whatever it is? They're not trying to miss, but they still miss. Why? Because it's math. It's how it works. You're not going to get them all. So you have to realize that you are not going to get them all at the poker table. You are not going to get all of the plays that you know were definitively right, right at the poker table. You're going to mess up sometimes. You have to be honest and forgiving with yourself. Now, obviously, you want to practice a lot away from the table to the point that you don't mess up at the table, but everybody messes up. The worst is when you don't even know you're messing up, right? If you ran every hand you played through a GTO solver, you are going to be shocked at how many times you mess up you don't even know. Myself included, every good pro included. And um, that's both... Encouraging, but also a little depressing because it means you're just not that good. 
compared to what you could possibly be, but also that, you know, you can get a lot better, which is good. How do you know a solver is correct? The solver is a math program. If it can add, multiply, divide, and subtract, it's, it's going to be in good shape. Is what normal? Let's see. When studying, you satellite in a tournament, you tell it's easier to play the higher stakes than the small stakes. No, is that normal? No. Uh, I mean, look, you have to realize that as your opponents play better, you're going to have a better idea of what they're doing, but that's not really good. Imagine I announced to you, I'm going to play like a perfect GTO robot. I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing. Does that help you? No. You're going to lose. So as your opponents play better, yeah, it feels a little more comfortable a lot of the time because rangers are more defined, but you're not going to win any money, right? That's the, that's the trouble. GTO is great, but you mentioned specific exploits in your classes. Of course, you make money by taking advantage of what your opponents do wrong. We discussed that thoroughly. All right, tilt is for fish. Don't go on tilt. Realize everything's out of your control at the end of the day. I have this theory. I don't know if it's actually true. Probably is, though. Whenever you actually go to play essentially any game, or when you go to do essentially anything, when you're doing it, you're not actually doing much of anything. You're simply implementing the strategy that you learned away from the table. Now, you may know a strategy very well. You may not even know what strategy you have. You may just be clicking buttons. But you're basically implementing everything you've learned away from the table. You've studied, and you're going to go practice what you have studied. And that's that. And when you're actually playing, you're not really doing much, assuming that you do show up to the table well-rested, in a clear mind, and wanting to do your best, which, you know, is, is a whole another problem a lot of people have because they don't do those three things. But when you actually go to play, you're not really doing much. And if you're not actively studying away from the table, you're inevitably going to get lost. I mean, I say right here, right? Make a point to constantly improve your skills because over time, whatever edge you have is going to diminish. And you need to make sure that you are consistently improving at a faster rate than you are opponents. Did you stick to playing only stronger hands? I don't even know what you mean by that. I recommend playing good, strong, fundamentally sound poker. That does not mean only strong hands. All right. Move up or down when it makes sense within your bankroll and skill level. You got to have discipline, okay? You got to move up or down as it makes sense. We discussed this earlier. So many people refuse to move down when things go poorly. <clears throat> some people refuse to move up when things go well i fell in that category a long time ago a long time ago i uh i was playing 200 dollars buy and sit and goes you need about forty thousand dollars for 200 buy and sit 200 dollars buy and sit and goes got a cough all of a sudden what is happening to me so yeah i play i had four uh you need forty thousand bucks to play 200 dollars sit and goes fine I grinded them hard, grinded them hard. I got up to about $300,000, <laughs> seven times the bankroll I need. And then they implemented $500 buy and sit and goes. Okay, fine. I probably need what? 120K, 150K for that. I played the $500 games. Then they made $1,000 sit and goes. Then they made $2,000 sit and goes. And I was reasonably bankrolled for the $1,000, $2,000 games, but I really did not feel comfortable playing them. Why? I don't know. I guess because I was a mental game fish back whenever I was 19 years old. And I probably left some money on the table. That said, I probably also lacked confidence. And I think you find that a lot of poker players either are drastically overconfident or, I'm not going to say necessarily lacking confidence, but they are cautious when it comes to not wanting to lose all their money. Right? And that's that's usually that's the category I fall in is the category a lot of my friends fall in. They realize all right, I'm not the best poker player in the world, obviously. So I want to make sure that whatever game I'm playing, I have a decent edge in, right? So that makes them move up cautiously. And I think that's fine within reason, right? But it definitely cost me a lot of money. I mean, they opened up 25, 15 no limit games a long time ago, before the biggest stakes were were uh 510. They went from 510 for a long time, and I thought I could make more money playing sit and goes, and a lot of players did. And then they open up 2550, and a lot of the good pros move to 2550. And you can make more money, right? Because that's just how math works. And 
I did not move. I thought the sit and goes would get softer, which they did. My win rate went up a little bit, but I lost a lot of experience and I did not get to play with a lot of the best, well, a lot, a lot of the weaker players, right? Plus a lot of the good players. I missed out on a lot of experience because I did not move up as it made sense. And that was probably a mistake. That was probably a mistake. You need 200 buy-ins to play nine person sit and goes? Uh, yeah, probably more. <laughs> probably more as your edge is smaller. You think it's better to be conservative with your bankroll or risky? I think it's, well, go read pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. I explain what makes sense. I think a lot of people think risky is huh, what I think is nuts. And I think most people think conservative is what I think is risky, to be fair, because that's how math works. Again, it's important to understand math. Like with sitting goes, right? You need 200 buy-ins for sure, unless you're playing with like a 10% ROI or, or bigger, right? And this is how it goes. I mean, it's a math game. You're going to go on down swings. Hate to break it to you. Let's discuss having discipline again. Quit your session when your edge becomes zero or small. And when I say session, I mean don't rebuy in a tournament if your edge is small. Uh, quit a game if all the bad players quit. You got to realize, assuming you're playing to make money today, which maybe you are, maybe you aren't, you want to make sure you have an edge in whatever game you are playing. So say you're playing your cash game, and there are two bad players, and they both go broke, and they get up and they leave. And then they replace those to players with decent players. Well, now you're sitting there playing with a bunch of decent players. Whatever edge you have is going to be kind of small, right? Because if everybody's decent and you're decent, you're just trading money back and forth, losing the rake, and maybe somebody doesn't have a little bit of an edge. And why are you doing that? You're just sitting there at the table to make no money. So unless you think the game's going to get better in the near future or you're waiting to get on another table or something like that, unless you have a reason to think your edge is going to get bigger in the future, time to pack it up and go home. Say you're playing a tournament, and it's a re-entry tournament, and you bust on the first hand with pocket aces, and you re-enter, fine. Say now you go and you um, you play for four hours, and you get it all in with aces again, and you lose. Should you re-enter? So far, you've played well. You got in with aces twice. You lost. You don't care. You're not on tilt because you're not a fish. Should you re-enter? Well, I don't know. Like we discussed earlier, has your edge diminished to the point that you're playing now for 2% return on investment? Maybe. Maybe 5% if you think you're worse than you are. I don't know. 5% is not a lot in a $500 tournament. It means, if you, it means you're going to play for like two hours to make $25 on hour. Uh, two at $25 on average. Keep that in mind. You play a $500 buy and re-entry tournament and you think you're going to make 5%. You're making $25. Win or lose, you're going to make $25. Bucks. Is it worth it to you to play a tournament for on, a, on average for an hour or two to make $25? Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Probably not, though. And it also puts a big strain on your bankroll because you need a gigantic edge. So, should you even play? Again, a lot of people play poker for fun and to be entertained, and there's nothing wrong with that. But understand, that's not really the people I'm talking to here today. I'm talking to the people who want to try to win money from poker and want to make the most of their opportunities and want to be the most productive human they can be, right? And you have to make good use of your time. I know it's frustrating to go play a poker tournament and then not re-enter because of discipline. But that's how you succeed. The players who re-enter with no edge or minimal edge or negative edge, they lose. I don't want you to be losers. I know a lot of people are losers. <laughs> and I don't want you all to be losers. Funny enough, my, uh, my son James has been playing chess tournaments and he lost. And I'm like, yeah, you lost. <laughs> and, <laughs> and sometimes I inevitably call him a loser. Um, and my wife doesn't like that, but, but, but like, I don't think, I don't think it's bad to call someone a loser. If you lost, if you're losing consistently, you're a loser at poker. Sorry, you are right. Sorry, you are rampage reentered at one. I wonder what people think whenever they say comments like that, like, are you dense? Are you trying to be funny? Or are you like, I hope you're just dense. And if you're dense, look, you got to enlighten yourself a little bit. Obviously, you can re-enter and win. That's not what I said. Did I say that at all? Did I say you cannot re-enter and win? I've re-entered plenty of times with Minimal Edge and won. It happens. Sometimes you run hot, right? Don't be dense, everyone. Don't waste people's time. And if you are actually dense, please enlighten yourself. Sit back, relax. No need to comment if you're going to be saying dense things. You're not made for 5% ROI. Yeah, indeed. Should you max late reg big field tournaments? Depends on your edge. Depends entirely on your edge. On your edge, most people think they have an edge late, but they don't. You got to realize if you're paying 10% rake, 
you got to beat that. So, I mean, what, you think your opponents don't know how to play short stack poker at all? What kind of a downswing can you expect in a nine-handed sit and go with a 10% RI? I don't know, 100, 120, 150? When should you engage in one-on-one -on -one coaching? Once you've done a prerequisite amount of studying. We discussed this earlier, Jonathan. Check out pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. This is very basic. But then check out pokercoaching.com's tournament or cash game masterclass. In my mind, these are prerequisites to work with me and to work with most other coaches. Because otherwise, you're just going to be paying a lot of money to get, I'm not going to call it basic information, but you're going to get information that you can get in a very easily consumable, very structured format here that will make you pretty good at poker. How is poker profitable when you need 200 buy-ins? How is it not profitable? What do you mean? There's swings in, in poker and in life and everything else, everyone. I mean, it takes a lot of money to make a little bit of money, if you all didn't know that. That's what bankroll does suggest to have a game or to play a game. Look at pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. Isn't it great I already did all the hard work for all of you? You can just read it. It makes your life so easy. What aspects of your game can you work on in sit and goes? I would generally not recommend playing sit and goes today. I think um, the game's basically dead. That said, they are good for learning payout application situations. But the problem is, is they don't actually reflect the payouts of most final tables. So you learn kind of weird payout applications. But you do learn how to study with payout applications, which is very valuable. Does age matter with poker? I don't know. There's probably not any great studies about how well do 10-year-old players do at poker. Two hundred buy-ins for nine max sit and goes. Okay, yeah, okay. It is what it is. It is what it is. Not enough people here have lost twenty-three coin flips in a row. <laughs> yeah, I remember one time when I was a young fish, I kept track of how many times I lost with aces in a row because it felt like a lot. And I went back and looked at it, and it was like twenty-eight times I lost with aces in a, in a row, all in preflop. It was just nuts. It was a gigantic downswing, and it makes you think like, is this site rigged? But no, it's not. It's just variance. If you play enough, you're going to catch some pretty bad runs. You're going to catch some pretty bad runs. What's well, my opinion on getting staked at the beginning of your poker journey? Why would anybody in their right mind want to stake you if you don't know how to play? Did you make money this year? This year just got started, but yes, I'm up a decent chunk. What's the benefit of late registering? Not much, honestly. I mean, there is this theory that if you uh, late register very late and you play short stacks perfectly against deeper stacks, you should have a decent edge. When I say decent edge, you should have like 10% edge. And you don't actually have to play all that long, right? If you don't have to play all that long, then if you make 10% on a $20,000, $25,000 buying tournament, you make $2,500 in two hours of play, it's a good deal. Or if you can play a lot of a lot of volume doing that, it's a good deal too. And you don't actually have to study all that much because if you if you buy in and you have, have like 12 big blinds or 15 big blinds, you can just get really good at 15 big blind poker and not even worry about ever learning 40 big blind poker or 100 big blind poker, right? Because you're never going to have that stack. You really don't need to worry about 100 big blind poker, that's for sure. And so there are a lot of online players who are very good at short stacked poker and they have, they're clueless about deep stack poker. And if you're Taking that method, you're going to miss out on a lot of great money-making opportunities from deep stack, slow structure tournaments, but it also makes your studying a whole lot easier and you can really specialize on one specific thing. No reasonable person stakes beginning players. That's for sure. Only 74 likes. You know, this was a tough topic today. This was a tough topic today. A lot of people don't like the truth. They want to be made to feel good. They want to be made to entertain. Sorry, I don't dance around like a circus clown and I don't make funny jokes and I don't show you all my big winning pots. That's not what I'm going for here, though. We're going for reality. Does poker coaching offer staking? No, I teach you to play well such that you never need staking. Listen, at the end of the day, why do you want to give someone half of your money or more? Why in the world, explain this to me, somebody, why would you want to give someone half of your money? I'll tell you the only reason getting staked makes any sense. Getting staked makes sense when you're going to get a substantial amount of education and mentoring and whatnot for free. It's really the only time it makes a lot of sense. It's going to sound bad, but a lot of poker backing groups want to stake people who have life leaks. They want to stake people who are good at poker, but bad at life. Now, some staking groups make a point to try to make everyone excellent. Like the Pokar Backing Company. I'm involved with the Pokar Backing Company. They are not uh, 
malicious or negative at all. And they actively work on making people improve their life skills. Cause you know, worst case you get good, you win a ton of money, you get rich, maybe you buy a piece of the company or something. But a lot of staking groups try to find people with problems and you don't want to have problems. Man, oh man, it's always good when you get a cough in the middle of your show in the morning. I have to make a lot of videos today. That's not good. But yeah, why do you want to get staked? Why do you want to get staked? Why would someone, why do you want to give someone half of your profits? That's my question. If you know you're a winning player, why would you want to give someone half your money? And it doesn't make sense. Now, there are a few spots where you should get staked. That's when the buy-ins get exponential. For example, I'm selling some action. Getting staked to the uh, $10,000 to $50,000 buy-in tournaments coming up in uh, later this month at the Poker Go Studio. And look, right now, I want to play average buy-in like 10 k give or take. Maybe 15 k something like that. And, you know, 50 and 25 are bigger than 15. So, sell some action. I'm happy to sell it no markup for all of you. I'm not trying to big all of you. I'm not trying to get the markup police after me because of the people who love the drama and love the nonsense. Just want to play 15 k so that's it, you know? Yeah, why do people want to get staked? Because they lack bankroll management. They want to try to move up. It's actually kind of dumb to want to play the higher stake, by the way. Um, unless you're exceptionally good and there aren't that, there's not that much volume at your current stake. Because if you think about it, say you're bankrolled for one three no limit. Why would you want to play two five and give away half of your profit? Why not just play one three and keep all your money? Right? I mean, you make the same amount of profit out the door. So why not play in the game where your edge is higher? You're going to have a higher win rate playing with your own money. Does that make sense? When should you float other than the pre-flop action? You want to you want to float with a wide range when the board is good for your range and bad for your opponent's range. You also want to float a lot whenever your opponent's going to check the turn a lot. They want to get staked because they gamble away all their money. Yeah. A lot of people gamble away all their money. But that means they did not find a game they can beat and they did not play it a lot and they did not keep a proper bankroll. By the way, your bankroll is not used for gambling in the pit. Uh, that should be made clear. I thought that was obvious, but maybe not. Is there a percentage of rake that the game becomes unbeatable? No, it depends on how bad your opponents are. Negreanu talked about this a lot in the whole more rake is better thing, um, where he discussed that more rake was better for the bad players, which is probably true, because the if the rake is high, it keeps the good players out of the game because nobody can win. But now there's no good players in the game, therefore now the only winner is the casino. And the casino, if they're not greedy, you know, they win, they win some, but not a lot. They win some. Imagine they rake away two buy-ins a day. That means eight buy-ins stay at the table. Not so bad. Imagine a pro comes there and wins five buy-ins and the casino rakes one. Now there's six buy-ins leaving. Clearly worse for the bad players if there's a good player smashing them, right? So um, what it amounts to, though, is that uh, at some point, it, it just depends on how bad your opponents are. Depends on how bad your opponents are. If your opponents are atrociously terrible, you can, you can beat a very high rank. If there's no penalty for playing tightly, for example then you can beat a high rake. The way you beat a high rake, by the way, is to play really, really tight. Tight and aggressive. Essentially, don't pay the rake. How do you not pay the rake? Well, don't play very many pots, right? How do you increase your stamina? Practice more, focus more, play long tournaments than other games. I'm very lucky in that I started with Magic the Gathering and Magic the Gathering tournaments sometimes last 14 hours a day, right? And I was doing that when I was 12 years old. So I've been playing long, long, long sessions since I was 12 years old. And inevitably, it just becomes natural and normal. Now, maybe you're not doing things to continuously fuel yourself. Maybe you're not drinking a lot of water, eating some healthy food. Maybe you're not stretching. Maybe you're not going outside. Maybe you're not taking time away from the game, right? Like during your breaks, are you talking to your friends about poker and stressing out about all the hands you played? If you're doing that, you're probably not doing it right. During your breaks... Get outside and relax your mind, if at all possible. Yeah, be in shape. Be in decent physical shape. That's also important. Now, I don't think you want to be super ripped, because if you're super ripped, you have to eat a lot of food. You don't want to eat a lot of food. You don't want to be sitting there jonesing for anything. Ideally, you don't want to be jonesing for anything at all when you're playing poker, which means, you know, don't, don't be hungover. Don't be wanting cigarettes. Don't be wanting drugs. Don't be wanting caffeine. Don't be tired, right? I mean... You want to ideally be able to sit there with a clear mind and
play cards. And you have to set yourself up for that. You know how many programs that you can practice categorizing hands in a range? I don't know about that so much. I mean, they have like Equilab. That's a pretty good one, but I don't know if that's necessarily what you mean. Um, hybrid Poker does something like that. Anyway, I have to get going now. If you want to study more, check out PokerCoaching.com. Sorry we had a heavy dose of reality today. No one liked the show. If you like the show, click like and subscribe. Next time I'll dance for all of you, I promise. Good luck. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. We are having a study session starting right now in the Poker Coaching Discord ran by Louis Philippe. Also, huge congrats to Dooley for winning the World Series of Poker Circuit event just the other day. Good job. Good work. I'm always happy to hear great successes. Thanks for being here. Good luck. Hope you have a wonderful week. Make the most of your opportunities. And I'll talk to all of you next time. Bye-bye.